Uh, thank you for coming to this talk. Um, I am Deepak Panikal and this is my colleague Andre Warinsky. We're both from Codeplay Software. Uh, so this talk is about, uh, it, it, it's just to you know, uh, show people how, how you can add a, uh, debugger support for, your, for so we have picked a small target and uh, it's just to show how you can add debugger support for your target uh, based on LLDB. To uh, so to start off with, so that's it's a general outline for the talk. Uh, we start with an overview of LLDB, uh, you know, talking about the generic architecture for LDB, uh, going into a bit more detail about LDB, LDB server, um, GDB, RSP, things like that, and then we move on to user scenarios. So we have to kind of uh, made the tutorial such that uh, you can use get all uh, cover up scenarios which are such as breakpoints, stack walking, uh, single stepping, things like that. And then we move on to uh, you know, uh, provide a couple of debugging tips. So, so the idea is that um, somebody wants to get started with LLDB uh, has an idea of you know, which, which files you, know, you have to uh, uh, modify just to get a get quick idea of what, what should be done. And in this talk we cover um, primarily cover MSP430. So we implemented uh, debugging for MSP430 for this tutorial, and we refer to ARM just for, uh, for the general cases. Um, and for both these architectures, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's ELF executables on Linux. So, yeah. Uh, so that's a basic overview of the talk. We start with the basics, giving a background, and then we move on to uh, uh, ELF and architecture support because you know, the first thing you want to do is load your binary, uh, then registers, uh, memory breakpoints, other key features, which would be, you know, stack, stack walking and uh, um, single stepping, things like that, and a quick creep as, at the end as well. So the basics. Uh, so that's, this is a generic diagram uh, architecture for LDB. So just to be clear, uh, LDB in caps here stands for the project, and LDB in lowercase means the binary. And that's LDB server. So it's just a generic diagram which, which uh, shows you how each of those components fit together. So the user driver here uh, can be the command line driver that a user normally uses. Um, it can be LDBMI, which uh, works with Eclipse. Um, or you know, it, can, it could be the Python API or anything like that. And LDB talks to LDB server through GDB RSP. So I'll elaborate a bit more on LDB and LDB server in the, ne in the next slide. Um, and the debug API here, um, could be anything that LDB server is using to talk to the hardware. It could be Ptrace, it could be an API that your driver has, your simulator has, uh, you know, so anything like that. So, so, so LDB kind of commands LDB server what to do, and it just follows, follows the instructions. Um, so yeah, this is a bit more detail here. So LDB runs on host. Um, so uh, wherever the, you know, the user is uh, doing, I mean, trying to control the debugger. Um, on the other hand, LDB server, um, can, it can run on remote as well as host. Um, it communicates to LLDB through GDB RSP. Um, LDB server interacts with the hardware or the simulator, and LLDB interacts with the user. And LDB is much more smart, smarter, so it understands symbols, dwarf information, sections, um, things like that. And on the other hand, LDB server is kind of dumb. It's, it's just to, it just follows instructions that LDB provides it. So it's very similar to GDB, GDB server, uh, you know, kind of separation, if you're familiar with that. So it's, it's the same idea, and both follow a plugin architecture, so it's quite easy to add modules to it. Um, it's quite maintainable, so it's very easy to work with it. So um, I, I, as you've seen the diagram here, LLDB talks to LDB server through GDB RSP. So just to give a bit more idea about GDB RSP, it's a simple ASCII message based protocol. It's designed for debugging remote targets. Um, so LLDB has kind of extended the, the protocol to have more, you know, to have additional packets for more information. And these are, this, it's available in uh, LLDB GDB remote.txt. Um, so you, if, you can check out the file in the repo to see all the, all the extra packets that LLDB uses. So that's a generic format. So there's a dollar to in, indicate a header, the packet data, and a checksum at the end. So it's, it's just, uh, so LLDB, for, for an example, um, this, this, is, this is a sample session that, uh, is, happens in the beginning when LDB talks to LDB server, uh, when, you start, when you try to start a debugging session. So as you can see here, this, this particular packet, Q thread suffix supported. So LDB is asking LDB server, uh, do you support uh, me adding a thread ID at the end of every packet? And LDB server here is saying, yeah, okay. So that's fine. So th that's a generic, you know, uh, an example of how a packet looks like. 
And that's another packet where it, LLDB asks for Q host info. Uh, and so it sends back, you know, all this information with this, uh, it's encoded in hex, so it just says ARM, Linux, Android. So just an example and, you know, kind of uh, clarifying how these things work together. And it's quite important to understand GDB RSP because uh, for, uh, for a lot of times when you're deep, trying to debug LLDB, it's, uh, most of the times you will be do looking at it from the packet point of view because that's what happens in the middle. And then you can figure out what's going wrong in LLDB or what's going wrong in LLDB server. Um, Sorry? You mean this? Yeah. It stands for ARM Linux Android. What, what does it stand for? Like cache? Ah, yeah. So LDB server will be compiled for uh, your target. So it will have the information. No. Um, so that is not the hash. That is the hash that I'm going to be sending you. It's just ah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So uh, moving on to the architectures for the talk. So like I mentioned before, we, we cover MSP430, for which we implement a debugging. Now, there is an, there is an LVM backend for MSP430, uh, but it's you know, highly experimental and uh, it's, yeah. Uh, but we are using GCC for this, for you know, at least compiling and getting, getting an executable. Um, it's not yet supported by LDB, so we wanted to select some an architecture which, through which we can actually uh, you know, commit something and upstream it, if possible. Um, so yeah, a lot of tools are available. It's quite easy to use it. And ARM, as you all very well know, it's uh, already supported by LDB and very popular. So a bit more information about MSP430. Um, there are uh, 16 registers in total. Um, there are four special ones, which are the R0, R1, R2, R3. Um, as you can see here, R0 is PC, R1 SP, stays register, R3 is a constant zero register. Also quite relevant is that it uses two-byte memory addressing. Um, and so we use MSP debug instead of LDB server. So, L so what we're going to do is LDB is going to talk to MSP debug. So we're kind of replacing MSP 430 GDB and going to use LDB instead. Uh, and we do not modify MSP debug. So we just take it as it is. Um, so that's, that's going to be the architecture when we use MSP debug. So it's just going to replace um, LDB server with MSP debug here. And it has a simulator in it. And it also has the GDB server as part of the same binary. And um, it can run as a simulator mo in this, with the, using this simulator, or can talk to the hardware through JTAG USB. So yeah, um, and uh, to get started with MSP430, it's quite straightforward. You just need to you know install, uh, and it's all available in in uh, in, the, in the normal repositories. You you get the, you get GCC, you get MSP debug, uh, everything you need to actually start off using this, uh, and that's just an example program. Uh, so this is how um, you compile. So here you have to specify the microcontroller, I mean the, the, the chip. So that kind of, it tells it to kind of pick up the right linker script there. Um, and yeah, O0 and G4 so that you, you know, can debug. So now that we have um, a binary, what, what is the next step, right? We want to load this binary in LRDB. So how do we go about that? We start off with, um, so LRDB already understands ELF. Uh, you know, Mako or PCOF executables. Um, it understands dwarf very well. Um, and the MSP430 GCC compiler provides an ELF with relatively good dwarf. So it should be pretty straightforward to get it working, right? Um, so when you try to load the executable for the first time, it complains that it doesn't understand the architecture. Um, so the first step would be to add the triple, the MSP430 triple to LLEB. How do you do that? So in this file, arcspec.cpp, which is uh, um, in LLDB, in the LDB repo, um, so we just add this, uh, this line here, which, which specifies that it's MSP430, it's little endian. Two stands for the memory addressing size, two for the min instruction size, and two for the max instruction size. You can compare that with ARM here, which is size four for the memory addressing, two for the min instruction, four for the mac, uh, max instruction size. And uh, here we kind of uh, match up the core to the ELF header, uh, which, which has a, you know, the MSP430 uh, machine code in it. So after, once we did that, we actually can load, the, load up a binary. And it's, quite, it's as simple as that. Uh, and because LDB understands ELF sections, um, everything just works uh, as it is. And this is not really required to go ahead with debugging, but it's, it's just to show how easy it is to add an, I mean, for if you check the ELF header for MSP430, it would say that the OS API is standalone. So that's how you would actually add that in, L, in uh, LLDB. And when you, when you can do the target list, you can see you know, the standalone thing appearing there. 
So now we have done this. Um, we can just dump all sections that we need. I mean, the, all the sections in the binary can, can we just be dumped straight away because LDB understands it all and passes it completely well. And say your architecture has some, you know, custom sections or something. What you would do is you'll actually modify object file elf.cpp to add those. Um, but unfortunately, when we try to dump the line table, uh, LDB complains and says that it cannot find source information. Um, though when we check, you know, using read elf, uh, there is a line table and seems to be fine. So something is going wrong somewhere. So we had to debug this. And yes, we cannot also look up symbols. So something is going wrong. So what we found was that uh, in the dwarf parser in LDB, it does not consider the case that address, address, addressing can be two bytes. And so, so it only take answers, you know, four or, four or eight bytes. So just by fixing that, I mean, it's, it's a quite a simple fix. Just took some time in debugging. If you just kind of, I mean, <coughs> but just by fixing that, now we can read the line table and also uh, look up symbols. So that's, it's a, so now at this point, we actually can load a binary. You know, LDB understands the line table, so which means you can actually set a breakpoint on a symbol. So it's quite straightforward, yeah. So I'll pass over to Andre to continue with the registers. Yeah, thank you, Park. So we're talking about different uh, user scenarios, uh, like registers, memory, so on and so forth, so stuff that's important from a uh, user's perspective. And I'm going to start with registers, and I think it's worth asking yourself here, why would I bother doing registers right now? So one main reason is if you're writing assembly level debugger, obviously you want to be able to read, write, modify registers because that's the integral part of debugging uh, assembly code. Now for MSP430, our debugger is actually source level, um, but we still need registers because LDB behind the scenes will be asking about uh, PC, stack pointer, frame pointer to, I don't know, for instance, when you hit a breakpoint and you want to see where exactly you in the source, you need the PC, so LDB be, will be doing this behind the scenes. So registers are very important and we actually need them right now to be able to proceed. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna focus on LDB server for ARM on running on Linux first. I'm gonna show you how you as a developer, you implement registers for your architecture. Then from then I'll show you how LDB, so the part that users is interfacing with, knows about registers. And uh, finally I'll, I'll jump to MSP430 and I'll show you exactly how we did it. Thanks for MSP430. So um, for LDB server, LDB server internally, it uses this uh, struct class called register context. Uh, it contains all the information on available registers and it also contains the interface for reading, writing, modifying registers. Um, and you, as a developer, you have to provide information in, uh, this, yeah. in this big array. Uh, there will be a different array corresponding to your architecture. So for ARM, you'll have uh, gregister enforce ARM and you provide information for all registers in this big array. So every line in this array corresponds to one register, and it's like this register info struct, which contains a lot of information. I'll jump into detail in a sec. Um, so, yeah. So register info. So that's the information you, in general, have to provide for every register, but you don't have to, you don't have to specify every single field. Obviously, name is important. Alternative name, it's something like PC. So for instance, for MSP4, you have R0, which is also PC. You want to be, be able to do register read PC, so you specify alternative name. A uh, byte size is fairly self-explanatory. Byte offset is actually my favorite. It's something specific to, uh, to Ptrace and Linux. So on Linux, you'll have your registers saved in the user area, and this offset specifies where in this, at which offset in memory, this particular register is being saved. Now, for MSP430, we're not using LDB server, and we're not using Linux. Only LDB runs on the host, so I don't care about it. Yeah, but for ARM or something more sophisticated, you have to take that into account. Um, the stuff that you have to specify is these enumerations. And that's basically for indexing registers. So LDB internal, you will be referring to register one, two, so on and so forth. So you really have to specify these numbers and you may as well just go from zero to whatever number of registers is, that's very important. Uh, there's a bunch of other numbers, but I don't have uh, time to go into detail, but this one is also very important. And that's basically used for uh, marking special registers. So PC, SP, frame pointer are those special registers. And you want uh, basically LDB behind the scenes. It refers to PC, SP. It doesn't understand the concept of R0, so on and so forth. It just wants to know PC. So you just use this uh, predefines from this file to mark PC, SP, frame pointer. There's return address, arguments, so on and so forth. For MSP430, we have only PC and SP. 
there's no frame point and there's no return address. Um, so that was LDB server. Uh, now for LDB, so user also wants to be able to have this information available, yeah, uh, and you want LDB to understand what's going on. So what normally happens, like for instance for ARM, when running on Linux, when you have LDB and LDB server, when you start your session, LDB will just send a bunch of packets. So it will send Q register info packets. So we'll be using GDB RSP. And there will be a packet corresponding to each register. So we'll start with register zero. And LDB server comes back with information. So name, size, offset, so on and so forth. And LDB will just loop over and do that for all registers. And after that, LDB builds its own copy of register context. And you can like read register zero, so on and so forth. And it's also worth mentioning here that GDB RSP is also later used when you want to read registers. So when you want to do register read, uh, this will correspond to LDB sending packets requesting register and the LDB server coming back with this unexciting value of zero. Um, so that's basically how LDB knows about registers, LDB server. Um, but you still have to implement LDB server actually reading and getting them from your, uh, from your inferior. So at least on Linux, uh, for instance, for ARM, uh, this is implemented in native uh, register context Linux. That's where you want to go if you're implementing something new but running on Linux. And um, in this case, this boils down to calling to ptrace. So ptrace uh, stands for process trace. It's a low level, very fancy and sophisticated tool that's used extensively by LDB server when you're on, on Linux. In this particular case, yeah, so everything happens in this function which just calls this ptrace wrapper and it'll just go and call ptrace with this argument. The first one specifies the request you want to make. So this one means go and check something in the user area because I mentioned the registers are being saved to user area. Uh, you have to pass a thread ID because each ptrace call is a, a, a thread. Uh, the offset, same offset that will specify earlier in register info and just where you want to actually save your, uh, where, you, where you want to save your register. Uh, if you want to instead write register, you just replace ptrace pqz with ptrace oqz. So, is all this is in LDB server? Yeah. Uh, if you want to debug recently, then you don't have LDB server. Will that be a library that LDB then uses in the same way that LDB server uses? Or do you have to rewrite the whole logic to do reprogramming or something like that? Uh, the way things are implement right now, you'll be using LDB server even if you're debugging natively. Really? That's default from release 3.7. That's a bit waste of... That's... Some stuff going yeah, but makes things more consistent. Anyway, so this was for, uh, for LDB server when doing stuff, for instance, for ARM on Linux. Um, for MSP430, for because we're not using LDB server, we're actually using MSP debug that does all the magic for us behind the scenes. Uh, well, we still have to implement registers. And I mentioned that originally you put them in LDB server by uh, propagating this big array. Well, I don't use LDB server here, so I have to do something else. So fortunately, LDB facilitates this extra tool. You can uh, specify your registers in a Python script and load them at the beginning of your session. And it's pretty much exactly for this sort of scenario. So for MSP430, we just specified our registers in, in this Python script. And as you can see, it's very similar to what I did originally for ARM. Obviously, the size is 16, uh, R0 is PC. And later on, you can load it using this command. Uh, and yeah, that's it, that's, that's MSP430, that's just registers. And this is just to confirm that, yeah, after this, we're actually able to read registers. So when I'm doing register read, uh, uh, this boils down to LDB sending G packet with corresponds, could you please return me all global uh, general purpose registers? Uh, and LDB server comes back with this uh, long string of numbers, which LDB can now interpret because it also has its own uh, register context. So that's implemented. Now, memory and breakpoints. I'm gonna quickly skim through over memory because that's actually a bit unexciting, but I need memory for breakpoints, which are much more interesting, and I'm gonna focus more on uh, breakpoints. So for memory, you as a user, you type memory read in LDB, memory address where you want to read. Uh, LDB sends a packet to LDB server. Yeah, I want to read memory at this address. 
read me this many bytes. This is something, this value is predefined in LDB. You can tweak it. And LDB server comes back with what it's read. Again, slightly unexciting. On Linux and ARM um, and LDB server, what happens behind the scenes, again, it's ptrace. So in this file, native process Linux, you'll see a call to ptrace. This time it's ptrace peak data for reading data. And that's, uh, that's LDB server. For MSP430, because we're using MSP debug, we only care for the packet to go from one end to another, which just works by default. We didn't have to tweak anything. Um, for breakpoints, this is slightly more involved. Um, so I'm gonna start with this diagram to sh just quickly explain what happens when you want to do breakpoints. So um, again, I'm gonna start with LDB server and things running on Linux, for instance, for ARM. So let's assume, yeah, we have our user process uh, uh, behind which is the inferior we want to debug. Uh, I assume it's already being a ptrace by which I mean we are touched with ptrace. That's what LDB server gonna do behind the scenes when you're debugging. Uh, and you want to inject, uh, you want to have a break breakpoint at some location in your executable, which corresponds to the debugger injecting break instruction or trap instruction or whatever your architecture supports, but uh, it's roughly the same thing. You want to inject this break instruction and then just let the inferior to execute. Once the execution hits the break instruction, at least on Linux, that's gonna trigger SIG trap, which LDB, LDB server will most likely interpret as a breakpoint and say, hey, hooray, I got a breakpoint, I'm gonna let you do some magic stuff which happens just here, and I don't know, read registers, uh, read memory, modify registers, so on and so forth. Once you're done, LDB will just return control, uh, put the original instruction at that location, and let the inferior continue execution. Now, I'm gonna just focus on one specific scenario, but I think it's worth mentioning that because LDB server is using, is using ptrace extensively, and ptrace, once tracing a, a, a threat, will intercept all the signals, this is actually quite complicated. There's a lot of things going on, but obviously we don't have time to cover all the, all the details. So what I'm, what I'm gonna show you is how is this break instruction being injected because that's the meat behind setting a breakpoint. So this roughly happens in this file. And as you can see, it starts by get software breakpoint trap code. So you need the opcode for your trap or break instruction. Once that's, once that's uh, available, you go here, enable software breakpoint, and what happens, you read memory. Excellent, I got memory read implemented, so I'm very happy. Uh, you read memory, you get the original instruction at location you want to set your breakpoint at. You save that instruction, and you write trap opcode. And that's it, breakpoint sorted, yeah? Behind the scenes, there's a lot of things going on, and um, LDB implements some complicated logic for controlling breakpoints, enabling you to set them in different ways, but down at the bottom, this is what happens. Now, what we haven't done for MSP430 yet is implement the opcode. I haven't mentioned that anywhere. So normally, again, on LDB server side, this is implemented in native process Linux, and you see opcodes for different architectures. So you're implementing something new, you have to come here and add it as well. Now, again, for MSP430, we're not using LDB server, so I didn't have to do that. We, we didn't implement that. Uh, however, we did have to specify the opcode on LDB side in this file, so we did it, just following the convention in the file, so that's the opcode. Though, the funny thing is we didn't really need the opcode because why would you need it on the LDB side, which is interfaces with user? We actually needed the opcode size, and that's gonna, that's gonna be obvious on the next slide. So, here just to show you from beginning to the end how a break, setting breakpoint works. Uh, you start with a user setting breakpoint at main. Uh, it's resolved immediately to this address because main is one of the first symbols that are being loaded. If it's not resolved immediately because it's something dynamically loaded, resolution happens later. But once the resolution is done, LDB just sends a packet. Oh, could you set the breakpoint for me at this address, which is taken from here? And this number two is the trap opcode size, which is sent to LDB server as a hint just in case LDB server gets confused and doesn't know what to do, yeah? And that's the only reason we had to specify this opcode for MSP430. Otherwise, it's as far as I can tell, it's not being used. Um, once LDB server receives the packet, which it does here, it says, yeah, okay, um, it'll just overwrite the instruction uh, at the location where you want to set your breakpoint, and when the breakpoint is hit, you get the 
uh, packet from LDB server, stop packet with signal 05, which corresponds to stick trap with registers. And LDB displays you this very nice uh, message. Uh, yeah? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. honestly, we checked, but probably not thoroughly enough. As far as I can tell, we needed that, but I'm not going to commit myself to that right now. Yeah, but MSP debug is actually not using this information, it's neglecting it. But you just, you just want, yeah, may, well, but then you're not being consistent with what's already being done, yeah. Um, yeah, so after all these steps, uh, at least for MSP430, we already have like proper debugging experience. So after loading the executable, uh, we set the breakpoint and at this line, continue, hit the breakpoint, have all the source displayed, L be showing us nicely. And this, is, this was possible because Deepak fixed the problem with both information. Uh, single stepping also works pretty much out of the box already. So that's quite a lot. Uh, but there's still a few features missing. Uh, and that's going to be something Deepak will talk about. Um, thank you, Andre. All right, so now uh, you know, we, have, uh, we, we can rewrite registers, we can rewrite memory. Uh, we, um, we can set breakpoints. So, you know, most of the common scenarios have been covered. So what are the other, other you know, key features remaining, right? So I'll start with the ABI. So why do we need to impl implement the ABI uh, plugin? Uh, so like I mentioned before, in LLDB, everything is plugin-based. So for, a you know, for the ABI, uh, for, uh, for every architecture, there is, there is a separate plugin for every architecture. Uh, so we, have to, we are kind of trying to follow the same thing here for MSP as well. Um, so why do, why do we need this? We, uh, we need this if we want, uh, you know, obviously call uh, stack unwinding to work. Um, or it's also used in expression evaluation. Now, how do you implement an, a an ABI plugin? So it's based on the calling convention of the architecture, which kind of specifies, you know, how, a, you know, how do you call a function, which, which um, registers will be used for passing the arguments, and things like that. Now, the ABI plugin also tells LDB about which register will be, you know, callee saved or caller, caller saved. So the ABI plugin, you know, you implement a couple of functions which kind of tells LDB different things, which it uses for express evaluation as well as uh, du du using st du during stack unwinding. And how is unwinding done? It's using a it's, it uses a lot of unwind plans. So it tries out different options. So one thing it tries to check is if the architecture has a stack or frame pointer, then it uses that information. Or if CFI, which is the call frame information, if that's available, in Dwarf, LLDB uses that information. So now CFI is generated by the compiler and available in Dwarf, and LLDB uses the info from the dot each frame. Now one thing we found for MSP 430 is that, I mean, unfortunately it doesn't have a frame pointer. And the CFI, it's, it's, it is also missing. I mean, now the compiler does generate, you know, the dot debug frame section, but LLDB somehow doesn't use that. And I did try to debug it, but uh, somehow it's not working. So I don't know enough about it to comment on it, but I, I guess, uh, I, like I was, when I was uh, talking to Tamas yesterday, I was saying that the doc debug frame should work, uh, but it's not working yet. So the other option is to actually implement an emulator to do this unwinding. So what did we do? We, I mean, I, we want, just want to see if we can, how quickly it is to get something small working, right? So we implemented an experimental ABI. So now that's the ABI which is available in the, in the, in the repo. Uh, and yeah, so it was kind of a hack where we should kind of set the PC to be hard-coded to be at SP plus two. So the unwind plan always picks up uh, the PC as SP plus two, which does work for, you know, a, a, just a one-case just a one, one case scenario where if, there, if the function has only one argument, it works. But obviously, it's not something uh, which works properly, but it has to be fixed in the future. Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess one way would be to uh, think about 
um, fixing the CFI part in LDB, if we can actually make it load uh, it from the do, a dot debug frame, or um, implement an emulator uh, as well. So as you can see here, the frames, the two frames here are actually correct, and the line numbers, they all match up, but the variable values are wrong, and you know, it's not unwinding all the way, all the way back to the mainframe. So something, something is going wrong. Um, but yeah, it, it, the file is already available, so you know it, it can be easily worked on. And I mean, this is an example for you know showing the, how the default unwinding works in ARM. So for every architecture, you know there is a create default unwind plan function, which kind of specifies how you do things. Uh, you know, if everything else fails, you know, if you don't have, um, you know, a like I said, dwarf information or you know anything of that sort, it kind of defaults to the uh, default unwind plan. And in, in case of ARM. If you first kind of designate the frame pointer, which is R11 and PC, and you set the CFA, so uh, your unplanned can, plan kind of specifies where your resistors would be. So here you say that frame pointer would be at CFA minus eight, and your PC would be at CFA minus four. I mean, CFA is the canonical frame address which points to the you know the beginning of the frame. So it's just an example, and I mean just to show you guys how you know how things are normally done and how you know how we would proceed. Um, and how you can proceed for implementing for your target. Um, and you know, these values will be used for storing the values into the respective registers and for unwinding the stack. So that's for the API. Uh, now expression evaluation. So because of the way LLDB works, we actually have simple expression evaluation for MSP430 without implementing any code whatsoever. Um, we can you know, display the values of variables. Um, you know, that's the address where y is. We can do, you know, do simple expressions like that. And what obviously what, what LDB is doing is it's using Clang behind the scenes, it's compiling the expression. And uh, normally it would do, uh, you know, use the JIT, but um, again for MSP430, that's not working, so we are, I, I'm not exactly sure if we can make it work, but so in this case it is using IR interpretation. Um, so I mean just to show how it works, like if for this expression that, that kind of you know, boils down to this, this IR where you know, the multiplication happens here, where it's multiplying the value by 10. And, so that, and that's how this, the, you get the value here and just confirming uh, the value, the data here and just to be more clear, the F kind of designates at the format, it should be decimal and S is for the, for two bytes. Um, and we found that for this to work, you have to actually use the latest uh, compiler from you know, Texas Instruments. And future work would be to actually have more complicated expressions, which can be done by implementing prepare to be a call in the ABI. So that kind of will tell LLDB how do you set up a function call? Which means we would be able to do something like uh, y is equal to y plus, say, calc, which is a function that exists in the binary. And we can do that by if we, if we, you know, once we implement that in the ABI. So it should be quite straightforward. And again, something for future work to be done. Uh, so that's, that's about express evaluation. Now, disassembly. So <laughs> we don't have a disassembly yet for MSP 413 LLVM. Uh, but again, because of the way you know, LDB works, if we had one, it will just directly pick it up. So we try to disassemble now. Uh, LDB just comes back with an error saying, sorry, I cannot find the disassemble plugin. Um, but it is as simple as, you know, if you once we implement that in L LLVM, it will just pick it up. Um, and here I've just shown how this works for ARM. And that's a file where this kind of hooking up happens, where in case of ARM, uh, the triple would be, you know, obviously the ARM triple. And here, because for ARM, there can be the case for thumb as well as ARM, there is a disassem uh, as well as an alternate disassem. So here, what, what they're doing is instantiating the triple for, for ARM here. So you get a disassembler for ARM. And you kind of set the string to thumb and get the triple for that. And then you use that to instantiate a thumb disassembler. Now, obviously, if we had an MSP for the disassembler, which is, again, something for future work, and maybe we can also, we can also work, work it on in the future for another talk, maybe, uh, that would actually just get instantiated here and we would be able to see disassembly. So we have source debug level debugging, but we can't see disassembly yet. Now, yeah, the final thing is single stepping. So we, again, we got this for free, uh, and, but I just wanted to show this so that you can know how, how you would do this for your own architecture. So what LDB does is LDBs will send the S, S packet to the to LDB server or MSB debug in this case. And so here you can see the PC is at C164 before. Before, before the step happens. The user types in S, LDB sends the S packet, uh, and we get this uh, packet back from MSPDU saying, hey, I've stopped at C166, 
which is obviously two bytes, I mean, after that. And so that's how single stepping works, very, very simple. And uh, in case of ARM or, you know, in the norm generic case, this boils down to this packet will be handled by native process Linux, uh, where there's a function called single step. So here is what, where you would, you know, if you had your own simulator or driver or something, here is what you, where you would call that. And in case, because we're using Peter's here, it kind of just asks, uh, oh, do I have hardware single stepping? In that case, you know, I can use Peter's single step. Or I can use continue, in which case the breakpoint will be, would have been set earlier. And the user would think that it's, it's, uh, it's single stepping, but it's basically, you know, continuing after setting a breakpoint on the next instruction. So, yeah. So that's two ways how this would work. So yeah, that kind of covers the most common scenarios, and I will kind of hand over to Andre to okay. continue with the debugging tips. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, you can't. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, there are, there are ways in LDB where you can actually, uh, you know, there, I mean, I believe, I mean, I, I actually forgot which source file, but uh, you check if there are branches in the next instruction, or in the coming instructions, and then, uh, you know, account for that when you set the next, the breakpoint where you want to step to. So, yeah. Yeah, it, it'll be much slower, yeah. Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, thanks, Deepak. So now, just uh, quickly go through uh, some debugging tips, most of which is common sense on one hand. On the other hand, stuff that you tend to forget about. And this stuff is actually LDB specific. So throughout the talk, for instance, we've been showing you packets, uh, which we look at frequently. Because you have LDB, you have LDB server, or, or MSB debug, which is a GDB server. They communicate with each other. There's one thing done by one the other thing done by the other. And you have to make sure the communication is smooth and, and you want to make sure that uh, good things are happening on both ends. So for instance, for this talk, we use uh, log-enabled GDB remote packets, which shows you those packets as you're debugging. So that's extremely useful. Uh, you can use different log channels uh, and different categories, and you can list them all using log list. Uh, there's actually a lot of categories. We're only listing. Uh, some of the most uh, interesting ones, but there's like stuff for processes, threads, breakpoints, uh, dynamic linking, so on and so forth. And this is extremely useful. Um, other thing, uh, yeah, block enable LDB unwind uh, for tracing unwinding. But um, there's another thing that's also very useful is that throughout the talk, I've been showing you packets from LDB only because you as a user use LDB, you type log enable uh, in, in LDB and you see the packets in LDB. Now, question is, there's LDB server running somewhere. It's receiving packets, it's sending packets, but how can you be sure it's receiving and sending the right packets? So very often you want to see the packets coming and leaving LDB server. 
And for that, you actually have to start LDB server explicitly rather than letting LDB spawn the process running LDB server. So normally when you run LDB, it'll just LD start LDB server behind the scenes and you can't really see the packets. Well, there's a trick, but this is actually easier. So you start LDB server uh, in uh, GDB mode. You specify your log file. In this case, this is just standard output. And you specify your channels. In this case, we use uh, uh, GDB remote and all. Uh, maybe you want to narrow it down to packets or something else. Uh, localhost, because this is running on localhost, you specify the port you're going to use for connecting with LDB. You then have to use the same port uh, on the LDB side and just specify the binary. This is something, again, that's we, that we use uh, frequently. Another thing is, um, for instance, uh, the way it normally works, you type a command in LDB, LDB sends a packet to LDB server to trigger some action on LDB, LDB, LDB server side. Now, imagine you're just implementing something on the LDB server side. You don't want to bother yourself with LDB, uh, and there's a lot of work involved in LDB, and you just want to do LDB server. Well, you can actually trigger that action on the LDB server side by just sending the packet. And you can use that. You can use process plugin packet send just to send a packet. So rather than like implementing complex stuff on LDB, on LDB side, you just say, yeah, send me a packet. And for instance, here I'm requesting information on general purpose registers, and LDB server just responses. So that's Another very useful thing. Um, uh, more, more generic stuff. Uh, make sure you build in debug mode, which is simple but often forgotten. Uh, uh, verify your dwarf, dwarf uh, using some external tools. For instance, for MSP430, uh, yeah, we had this information. Uh, well, we had this problem. There were no line numbers. And our first assumption was there's something wrong with the, with the compiler uh, or there's something wrong with LDB. But then, we checked Dwarf using uh, other tools, and it's like, yeah, the Dwarf is actually fine, so there's something wrong with LDB. That's very helpful. You have to use external and reliable tools to verify that stuff is uh, correct. Uh, image dump sections, this is a command from LDB that, for instance, you can use when once you implement your triple, you know you should be able to read your ELF. Uh, just do image dump sections, and are the sections correct? That's how you verify this. Uh, Obj dump and read ELF, this is, Again, uh, you can use that to check this assembly. Uh, you can use that to check um, the header in your, in your binary. And then later on, you go to LDB server and verify that L LDB actually reads the binary correctly as well. Yeah? Um, S-trace for, for, for tracing, for instance, uh, signals uh, in Linux. Yeah, I mentioned that uh, when you're using P-trace, which LDB server does extensively, P-Trace will be intercepting signals. So again, you have to control that, see what's going on, make sure that signals are correct and, and being uh, 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 treated the way they should be. And last but not least, uh, definitely for MSP430, for we actually use GDB, and we use GDB frequently. So even though LDB is, is fantastic, you never stop using GDB because we just use it as a reference. There were things that didn't work for, for us in LDB. We just went to MSP430 GDB, which is just the port of GDB for MSP430. Make sure it actually works. OK, so we're doing something wrong. Uh, so that's, that's something very useful. Yeah, GDB. Yeah, GDB is also more forgiving than LDB. So sometimes things are gonna work on GDB even though they should. And yeah. um, now just a quick recap for MSP430 because we've been jumping from ARM to MSP430, and the key point here is that we implemented support for MSP430 in LDB. So what we had to do: uh, add the triple to be able to understand the binaries. Uh, uh, implementing registers in a Python script, uh, fixing dwarf, or more precisely, making sure that LDB appreciates that addresses can be two byte wide. Uh, breakpoint opcode, again, just to construct the, the packet to request a breakpoint. Uh, and finally, we have also experimental ADI, uh, which works in some particular scenarios. Um, 
a lot of credit for this goes to MSP Debug, which is really nicely written. Uh, the source is, is clean, and it's really easy to follow. So that was extremely useful. Uh, and also, uh, Benotils that can be find, uh, found on TI's website. Again, very well documented. Uh, and we went there many times. And just to summar summarize, uh, because it's not that straightforward how to actually use this debugger, uh, just a sample session. So we mentioned in the beginning that for MSP430, we're using MSP debug. That's our GDB server. And you start by initiating that. So you just type, in this case, MSP debug sim to start it in simulator mode. You specify your executable that you want to debug. And finally, you type GDB to turn MSP debug into GDB remote mode. And it defaults to port 2000. So that's something you have to note on the LDB side. Next, you go to LDB. You specify your executable that you want to debug. Uh, you load your registers, set a breakpoint at main, connect to port 2000, and there you go. You connect it to the simulator. Now, um, now we're going to do a presentation because we actually last week managed to get it to work with actual hardware, not only with simulator. We're also using MSP Debug because MSP Debug is capable of talking to hardware. So we have a, uh, we have a small dev bot from uh, TI called Launchpad. Uh, we have uh, executable that flashes LEDs. There's two LEDs, uh, green and red. Uh, I'm afraid the VGA will blur it to orange, both of them probably. Uh, Yeah, just, yeah, okay, so this is flushing. So yeah, Launchpad is like, this board is like five pounds, so it's, it's just, uh, yeah, it doesn't require, you can go online, get it, and play around. So um, just start up MSP debug. So as you can see here, I mean, that's how you would start up if you're using a simulator. So just use a device directly. Shall I try focusing? Yeah. Okay. okay. Okay, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. One second. Yeah, okay, it's fine. So um, I load the binary here. Um, yeah, and I start up within GDB. And here we are starting LLDB with the L file. Um, so that's loaded, and you can see here, you know, the LDB kind of understands that it's MSP430. We, we are loading the registers here from the Python file. There's a delay function that's basically delay between uh, flushing one LED and the other so that you can actually see them changing rather than just jumping from one to, from uh, red to green. So yeah, connecting to the, to the server. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna put a breakpoint on this delay function. Continue. Hey. So yeah, so we hit the function and and you're just continuing, as you can see, the, the, the LED is shifting, but it's not very clear. But if I use the memory write command. Yeah, because uh, LEDs are memory mapped devices on this board, and you can check the memory address of that device online. So I mean, I can switch off the LED or you know, switch it on. Yeah, so we're writing to memory live as we stand here. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's it. That's, that covers it, yeah. And yeah, days to read. Uh, Sure yeah, I think, I think it's also worth uh, mentioning that we used the simulator for, for implementing this, but one of our colleagues, and thanks goes to Aiden, uh, said, oh, I got this dev board, uh, why shouldn't you try? And we were like, well, this is not gonna work, and it actually worked out of the box. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, I guess that, I'll just switch it on. Yeah. yeah, so now we can use LDB server for, uh, LDB, sorry, for uh, debugging MSP for 30. Uh, now, some homework. Every uh, self-respected tutorial should have some homework. Uh, and there's a couple of things we haven't finished, and the ABI, because what we got is experimental, and there's no disassembly. So that are pretty much two features missing for this debugger to be complete. Uh, we have an upstream, but we're planning to do so shortly. Uh, it's worth mentioning microcorruption. That's how I personally learned about MSP430, and it's basically a website for reverse engineering, like a toy website, uh, where MSP430 is claimed to be used to write, uh, to build locks, and you, as a enthusiast reverse engineer, go there and try to reverse engineer various, um, uh, various locks. 
It's really fun if you like this kind of stuff. Uh, and it's basically based on MSP430. The instruction set is small, and it, it's just fun. Um, if you want to write a debugger as well for some hardware, uh, you can use AVR. Uh, AVR is something that's used uh, uh, frequently for Arduino dev boards. So uh, we checked online. Uh, there's a debug a GDB server for that as well. Uh, so you should be able to follow our steps. I'm pretty sure you'll come across some other issues. Um, and uh, yeah, this is our GitHub repository. Uh, you can uh, pull our code, check exactly what we changed. Uh, we weren't able to put all the changes on slides because some of them are just repetitive, or, or uh, like in case of ABI, this is experimental. Uh, but yeah, um, if you have any further questions, just get in touch. Um, well, the way I, s I mean, it's going to be a personal opinion, but the way I see it is that now LED LEDB, like LLVM, is very, it's easily maintainable. Um, uh, you know, like you said, with the plug-in architecture and all, it's quite easy to use it. Now, the way I see it, how it's going on to go forward is that um, more and more people, like what happened with LLVM, more and more people are going to start using uh, debuggers. Um, like, what happened with LLVM was that uh, GCC used to be this thing which, you know, uh, Compilers were taught in uh, universities just as a special thing. But now people are using LVM in universities to learn deeply about actual work, I mean, doing real work, right? In the same way, I believe uh, LDB will also move towards people actually starting to learn debuggers while they're at uni, and LDB can actually facilitate that because it's so easy to understand and start over with. So, and I believe people will start using LDB for new things, you know, for analytics or profiling or things like that, which is not being done now. But as more and more people come into it, same about what's happening for Clang or LVM. I believe LDB will also move in that direction. So, yeah, that's the way I, but yeah, it's going to be an opinion, yeah.
No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. Still yeah, yeah. Leave it there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? 